That's so fun. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. Welcome to you in the sanctuary, and welcome to all of you in Zoom land. My name is Lynn Turvey. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm your service leader this morning. We're joined by our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison. We do hope you feel welcome here. Whatever you believe or do not believe, whomever you love, however you understand family, whatever your age, race, or ability, you are welcome here. We invite you to join us in a journey of free thought, spiritual questing, and justice making for as long as you feel comfortable doing so. We extend a special welcome to any visitors here this morning and hope and invite you to join us for conversation after the service. We begin our gathering acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. And so as we begin this special hour together, I invite you to quiet any noise-emitting devices so that we can enjoy the service. We hope you find something in this service to bring you joy, something to nourish your spirit and to help you find your balance and keep your balance. And we thank all of those who helped bring this service to us this morning, all those who helped in the sanctuary, all those up in our tech booth, and all the support people on Zoom. Thank you very much. I believe we have several announcements this morning. I think Reverend Rosemary has one, Gordon has one, and I have one as well. Good morning. I'm Reverend Rosemary Morrison. I'm happy and delighted to serve this congregation. I actually have three things I want to say. So on Monday, that's tomorrow, I will be at Brewster's Pub in Unity Square to greet anyone that wishes to come and have an enjoyable, low-pressure social time together with Edmonton Unitarians. So I'd love to see as many of you out there as we, as uh, hopefully it won't be too cold or snowy, so you feel like coming out. Um, so I'll be there about 6.15. Uh, after, right after the church service today, there's a brief meeting with the uh, Social Justice Committee that are going to be working on the in-house portion of social justice. Um, and I wanted to let you know, in the spirit of transparency, that uh, I'm expecting, my, uh, my daughter is expecting, but I am looking forward to <laughs> the birth of my second grandson. And he is due to arrive on February 27th. Um, it will be by cesarean section, so we get to know the date. And, oh, I'm, I'm muted on this one. That's what's going on. Okay. Um, so I will be going up to Whitehorse around the 22nd of February, and I will be working from home, as they say, but home will be Whitehorse for a couple of weeks while I attend to, uh, attend, attend to my family, and I'll actually be preaching uh, from Zoom on the 26th. So I'm looking forward to that and joining the people on Zoom and being, being that. I, I will record it just in case the... Uh, uh, it is the frozen north, and you never know what's going to happen with the internets up there. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that, um, just in case you're going, where did she go anyway? <laughs> but I will be available by email or phone um, uh, anytime. I will be working. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gordon Ritchie. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, Reverend Rosemary has asked me to speak very briefly about the service leader workshop that was recently held here at UCE. Um, what an exciting time that we had. It was uh, led by Reverend Rosemary. We had an amazing group of individuals gathered together 
uh, we discussed not only the current role of the service leader, but also started to think about how this particular role can evolve. Now, some of you may not realize that up to this point, for the most part, uh, Reverend Rosemary has been the sole creator of the majority of services that are held here at UCE. Uh, that means that she has brought her own insight and wisdom to create a service like we're experiencing this morning. And one of the things that came up over the, um, the time that we spent together in the workshop is that Reverend Rosemary will begin to work directly with the service leaders and will be encouraging them to bring their insight and wisdom into the mix as well, which I'm very, very excited about. Uh, so we can look forward to that in the future. And if there's any of you uh, that are interested in possibly becoming a service leader or would just like some more information on that, I'd be more than pleased to talk with you about that. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. And gulp, no pressure. <laughs> I was at the workshop, so it was very well, very well done. I quite, I quite enjoyed it. And remember this morning how I said how fun it is to, to ring the chimes. If you're, serv if you're service leader, you get to ring the chimes, so keep that in mind. I have a, an announcement as well. Uh, just a little update on uh, the work of uh, the Ministerial Transition Team. As you all know, there were small group discussions held January 8th and 15th. Uh, we will uh, provide a, oh, an overview, a, a summary of the feedback only in generalized themes, not in individual responses. And that will be available to you via a link in the Friday email that Janet sends out. So there'll be one this Friday, February 3rd, and it will show you the, that report that I just referred to. Um, and then some subsequent Fridays as well, in case you miss, miss that one. So they will be, uh, that will be available to the board, the congregation, the minister, that same way at that same time. And then we will provide a recommendation to the board on holding a congregational vote in March. So I do want to thank everyone who participated uh, in those small group discussions and making them so very fruitful. Thanks very much. Uh, also, you can um, have a look at the, a general overview of the work plan of the Ministerial Transition Team in the February newsletter coming out tomorrow, I believe, just to give you an idea what we have been doing and plan to do for the next few months. Now, in order to focus ourselves for the service, I invite you to an opening time of reflection as we listen to a prelude from Karen Mills, which she says is a nod to Robbie Burns Day. Thank you, Karen, that's delightful. So, let's try, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start over. Good morning. Good morning. 
Excellent. Excellent. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for being here online, uh, live online on Zoom or later on on YouTube. Um, so if you're on, uh, on Zoom or uh, watching later on, I recommend that you have something to write on or some, and something to write with for later on in the service. And if you're in the sanctuary, nobody has little yellow googly eye things. So at some point, you'll need a, a pen, pencil and um, a piece of paper. There might not be enough of the googly-eyed things to go around, but um, there is paper there as well when we run out. Or perhaps you might choose a piece of paper instead of a googly-eyed thing. During the service, if you're um, watching on YouTube later on, the story will be paused. There won't be any, um, there, because it's copyright, so it won't be on YouTube. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad I'm here. I'm so glad that we can be together this morning and take a few moments and remember what's important in our lives. Just a time to mark the week, take a moment to breathe, see our friends. I have opening words by Chip Rausch called Transfiguring Love. Deeper than DNA, more fundamental than molecules or quarks, at our living core, we are wholeness and transfiguring love. We often forget that power, becoming lonely or resentful, comparing ourselves to others, acting out of our fears rather than living our glory. Occasionally, we rouse from our trance to remember our wholeness. For a time, we embody unsentimental love. We make efforts to wake others and to remain fully present ourselves. Our lives and our time here together are made sacred by our striving. For the next, he says, 70 minutes, we'll see. And for the rest of our lives, may we be more aware of the spirit of life evolving through and among us. So may it be. I invite us to sing our first hymn gathered here, uh, 389 in the gray hymnal. It, it's just appeared and it is around and we did sing it last week. And so I just thought that was a good practice and warm up. And uh, this week we will sing it in a round and Lynn will guide this half and I will guide this half. So we'll see how it goes. I think we can do it. We're gonna, yes, I'm gonna sing once through in unison. Once through in unison, this half will start, this half will come in when Lynn brings you in. Please rise as you are willing and able. invite Robert Begg forward to, to light our chalice this morning. 
As he does so, I'll read these words by Reverend Scott Taylor. May the light we now kindle and the time we now share anchor us to that inner flame, that sacred center, which helps us remember who we were before the world told us who it wanted us to be. May our time together clear the way for those memories and voices and friends that lead us back home. Thank you, Robert. So we have a time for all ages this morning, Perfectly Norman by Tom Percival. The picture should come up on the screen in a bit. And for those of you, of course, as I said, it's going to be on, um, you'll see this, the pictures, and then on Zoom you'll see the pictures, but if you're watching on YouTube, um, the recorder's going to pause the recording now. Our next hymn is hymn number 108, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. Found in your gray hymnal and on the screen behind me. And please stand as you are willing and able to join in singing hymn number 108. purposes of this church community is to encourage all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and action. We take an offering that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit, an offering that will support this self-governing, self-supporting church and its many ministries. Those in the sanctuary can use the envelopes found either in the inside cover of your hymnal or on the back table uh, if you wish to receive a tax receipt for your donation. Many of our members and friends give monthly or annually through automatic withdrawal from their accounts. In addition to supporting this community, we also make a monthly commitment to the wider community. One half of the unidentified cash received is given to an outside organization. For the month of January, we are supporting Change for Children. 
For over 45 years, Change for Children has promoted health and human rights by championing creative solutions to poverty through sustainable development. Those of you online are encouraged to visit the Change for Children website to make a donation. And the offering is now being received. are by David Brooks, a New York Times columnist. Eulogy versus resume virtues. About once a month, I run across a person who radiates an inner light. These people can be in any walk of life. They seem deeply good. They listen well. They make you feel funny and valued. You often catch them looking after other people, and as they do so, their laugh is musical, and their manner is infused with gratitude. They are not thinking about what wonderful work they are doing. They are not thinking about themselves at all. When I meet such a person, it brightens my whole day. But I confess I often have a sadder thought. It occurs to me that I've achieved a decent level of career success, but I have not achieved that. I have not achieved that generosity of spirit or that depth of character. A few years ago, I realized that I wanted to be a bit more like those people. I realized that if I wanted to do that, I was going to have to work harder to save my own soul. I was going to have to have the sort of moral adventures that produce that kind of goodness. I was going to have to be better at balancing my life. It occurred to me that there were two sets of virtues, the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are the skills you bring to the marketplace. The eulogy virtues are the ones that are talked about at your funeral, whether you were kind, brave, honest, or faithful. Were you capable of deep love? We all know that the eulogy virtues are more important than the resume ones, but our culture and our educational systems spend more time teaching the skills and strategies you need for career success than the qualities you need to radiate that sort of inner light. Many of us are clearer on how to build an external career than how to build inner character. But if you live for external achievement, years pass and the deepest parts of you go unexplored and unstructured. You lack a moral vocabulary. It is easy to slip into a self-satisfied moral mediocrity. You grade yourself on a forgiving curve. You figure, as long as you're not obviously hurting anybody and people seem to like you, you, you must be okay. But you live with an unconscious boredom separated from the deepest meaning of life and the highest moral joys. Gradually, a humiliating gap opens between your actual self and your desired self, between you and those incandescent souls you sometimes meet. I have a hunch you'll find that those words may uh, be a really good introduction to uh, Reverend Rosemary's message coming up here, which, Hidden Directions, Navigating Wholeness. Thank you, Lynn. 
I have a little reading too from Parker Palmer's Let Your Life Speak, listening for the voice of vocation. Listening to life. Sometime when the river is ice, ask me the mistakes I have made. Ask me whether what I have done is my life. Others have come in this slow way into my thought, and some have tried to help or to hurt. Ask me what difference their strongest love or hate has made. I will listen to what you say. You and I can turn and look at the silent river and wait. We know the current is there, hidden, and there are comings and goings for miles away that hold the stillness exactly before us. What the river says, that is what I will say. And that is by William Sat Stafford in, from his poem, Ask Me. Parker Palmer goes on to just give a little, this is a little bit of what he says about that poem. Ask me whether what I have done is my life. For some, these words will be nonsense, nothing more than a poet's loose way with language and logic. Of course what I have done is my life. To what am I supposed to compare it? But for others, and I am one, the poet's words will be precise, piercing, and disquieting. They remind me of moments when it is clear if I have eyes to see that the life I am living is not the same as the life that wishes to live in me. In those moments, I sometimes catch a glimpse of my true life, a life hidden like the river beneath the ice. And in the spirit of the poet, I wonder, what am I meant to do? Who am I meant to be? End of quote. Can you picture it? Can you see yourself on that frozen river, walking or skating in one direction while the water below is going in the other? The wind makes your cheeks rosy. Your hands are warm inside your cozy mittens. And despite all this beauty, you can sense that something isn't quite right. The river under the ice has a different message for you. It wants to be paid attention to, to be noticed, and to be examined. Who said that? that Quote, an un unexamined life isn't worth living. Anybody remember? I've spent a lot of years, of, I'm glad I'm not the only one that couldn't remember. <laughs> I've spent a lot of my years of my life standing on that river of ice and thinking, I knew the direction I was headed or mostly wishing I was going in a different direction than I was actually going. Sometimes I was sure the ice was going to hold me. Sometimes I was sure it might not. There is an old Quaker saying, let your life speak. That phrase refers back to the Stafford poem, the powerful imagery suggesting there is a force underneath it all that we need to pay attention to. In Parker Palmer's words, what is the life that wants to speak in you? He's talking here about vocation. He does a lot of writing about teaching and vocation. However, I would like us to think about this in terms of our lives instead, both personally and congregationally. What are the hidden directions, the flow of the river under the ice that is at times obscured from our view and yet calling us ever onward? How do we follow the call, the current, 
the direction of our life. How do we know we are even going in the right direction? How do we let our life speak? And just so you know, I have no idea how to answer any of those questions. I'm just, we're just all walking each other home, as Ram Dass says. We do our best. However, we are offered a few clues along the way. I won't just leave you hanging there. I've got three or four things I'd like to suggest that we can help us figure out how to navigate, how to find our own wholeness. You know that moment? We've all experienced it. Somebody says something, or you read something, and immediately and for no apparent or good reason, your eyes fill with tears. You remember? Has that ever happened to you? It's just like, right? In that moment, there is a clue as what your li- as there is a clue of what your life is trying to say to you. So if you wish to let your life speak, if you wish to live the life that is meant to live in you, follow the flow of your tears as they are your wisest teachers. They are like the current of the river flowing in the direction you probably want to go. The second clue I can give you is a little more obscure. When your mind begins to rest, or you decide you're going to rest your mind, perhaps walking in the woods, meditating, maybe doing laps in the pool, staring out of the window, which I would like to advocate is a very, very important activity. I have come to my best thoughts and ideas and been given my best direction while staring out a window for a long, long time. So notice when you're doing this important activity of staring out the window or going for a walk in the woods, Notice where your mind wanders. Where does it go when you don't have reins on it? Try to be aware of its meanderings. You might catch a glimpse of the life that wants to live in you, helping you find your bearings or make a decision or how to feel about something or someone. But you have to be sneaky. You have to let your mind wander. At the same time, you have to have another piece of your mind kind of watching where your mind wanders in a sneaky, sleuthy kind of spy way. Otherwise, your mind won't actually wander if it knows you're following it. Try it. It actually works. So the third clue is a lesson I learned from a wise minister many years ago. And she said, when you're up against a decision, ask yourself, is what I am about to do life-giving or life-denying? In other words, will this decision bring opportunities that allow for growth and development and make my heart sing? Or is it what I'm supposed to do and feels like a scruffy yellow coat over a beautiful pair of wings? Denying the spirit of life within you. So here's my last idea. I have a thing I do when I have to make a big decision. I try, this, I try the decision on for a time, sometimes for a minute, an hour, sometimes up to a week, if it's a really big decision and I've got the time. Here's how it works. And, and by the way, don't stop me if I've already told you this, as I might have. So say I have a really important decision to make. I decide one way, okay, I'm going to, okay, I just sold my piano yesterday, so it was a big decision, so I could, I try on the decision, I'm going to sell my piano, how does that feel, or I'm going to take this job, or I'm going to move to this city, I keep that decision fresh in my mind, I wear it like a beautiful coat, what implications happen as I go on about my day and week, knowing that I'm actually going to take that job or sell my piano or move to the city? Then, when you've decided you have to move on, you 
take that decision off, shake yourself a little, because it might have felt funny, and then try on the other decision. I'm not going to sell my piano. I'm not going to take that job. I'm not going to move to that city. Wear that decision and see how it feels. What's the difference? Where was the energy? Did it flow like the river under the ice? Did you feel growth? Did you feel excited? What were the repercussions of each of these decisions? I'm sure each of you has a way to fi figure out your own life's path. And you may already be doing some of the things that resemble some of my processes. Everyone is their own wisest teacher. I just offer you these three or four things to help you as you determine how to let your life speak. In congregational life, the congregation has a vision, mission, and covenant. Remember those eulogy virtues that Lynn spoke about? Congregationally, we'll find our eulogy type virtues or values within our mission, vision, and covenant statements. They help lead the way for decision-making congregationally. The eulogy virtues or values embedded into UCE's vision, vision, mission, and covenant that I noticed right away, just at a first glance, were nurturing, accepting, engaging, welcoming, living with integrity, compassionate, honest, kind, responsible, healthy, ge generous, and brave. So that was just at a quick glance. Imagine if we really delved into them. If we were to let the vision, mission, and covenant really lead us, and we are saying that those things are the river under the ice that is flowing in the direction we wish to go, I wonder what would actually happen. Is there a limit to how healthy a person or a congregation can become? Or how generous or how loving? I don't know the answer to any of those questions. But did you know that the best words to be used in a eulogy came from our covenant? Our covenant tells us how to be together. Our vision points the way, and our mission is how we fulfill our vision. So the ways in which we are to be together congregationally are perhaps the same as the way we might want to be individually, if we might want to resemble our eulogy words and not our resume words. As we approach the second half of our church year together, I wonder how we will live into our eulogy virtues how will our vision, mission, and covenant guide us as we make the decisions for our congregation, for our relationships here, and our lives outside of these walls? How will we decide to live? How will we let our lives speak? Our vision, in case you were wondering, is UCE's vision is, op is we are open, we have open door, we open our doors, to all seekers of spiritual growth and nurture positive change for a just and healthy word, world. Our mission is to inspire social justice by questioning the status quo, engaging community, and inviting all to the table. Our covenant is, with love as our guide, we pledge to create a beloved community of peace and compassion. We trust our ability to work through conflict. And as members and friends, we agree to honor and respect diversity, to be truthful, kind, and open-minded, assume good intent and goodwill. Are you hearing eulogy virtues? Listen with open hearts and speak with care. Accept responsibility, address conflict promptly, 
be steadfast in support of our community. Share the ministry of our congregation. Express encouragement and appreciation. Can you even imagine what an exciting, enriching, and rewarding experience being, of, being part of this congregation could be? if we even began to live into these words, these virtues, these values a little bit. It sort of feels like we might end up, what do you think, like Norman, with some beautiful wings. Blessed be and amen. I'd like you to stay seated and sing hymn number 1031, filled with loving kindness, a Buddhist metta meditation. It's now time in our service that we light candles of joy and concern. If you're with us on Zoom, feel free to type your joys and concerns into the chat. And for you here in the sanctuary, we have two candle stations. I invite you to come down from the outside and light the candles facing towards the back of the sanctuary. So you light your, your taper light a candle and then extinguish it in the water and put your spent candle in the other basket. This is something that we do to build community, to share our care with one another. I invite you now to light candles of joy and concern.
I'd like Elaine to light two more candles for us. I don't know how to say the young man's name. One for Tyre, T-Y-R-E. Tyree. And one for all those spoken, unspoken, unlit, perhaps even unknown joys and concerns we hold in our hearts. Thank you, Lynn. I'd like to invite you in it into a time of meditation, always by invitation. Thinking about how it is only allowing ourselves to be empty of breath. Can we allow life-giving oxygen back into our bodies? What can you do to release that which you no longer need? To allow life-giving opportunities into your life. As you rest into the chair, allowing your muscles to relax, maybe give a little wiggle, taking a few deep breaths. Is there something blocking your breath from getting fully into your lungs and your diaphragm? As you focus on your breath, as you notice how your chest rises to accept this life-giving air and then shrinks back down to release, I offer you these words, What Comes from Spirit, by Richard Wagamese. From my window, I watch the sure and elegant creep of the sun across the pine-pocked flank of the mountain. Beneath it, the mercury platter of the lake and the undulation of the land dancing down to meet it at the reeds where the red-winged blackbirds sing. The sky is a bowl the color of old denim. Why do we gaze at sights like this in such awe and wonder, yet never take the time to see what miracles we ourselves are? We are that, you know. Miracles of creation, each of us. We are pieces of the sky dancing. I invite you into a few moments of silence and I'm going to read it again. From my window I watch the sure and elegant creep of the sun across the pine-pocked pine -pocked flank of the mountain. Beneath it, the mer mercury platter of the lake and the undulation of the land dancing down to meet it. It meets it at the reeds where the red-winged blackbirds sing. The sky is a bowl the color of old denim. Why do we gaze at sights like this in such awe and wonder, yet never take the time to see what miracles we ourselves are? We are that, you know. Miracles. Each of us. We are pieces of the sky dancing.
Why do we gaze at sights like this? In such awe and wonder, yet never take the time to see what miracles we ourselves are. We are that, you know, miracles, miracles of creation. Each of us, we, you and me, are pieces of the sky dancing. And when you are ready, I invite you to bat your eyes, wiggle your fingers, wiggle around in your chair, maybe make a fist and then stretch out your fingers a couple of times. Take a couple of big breaths while you shrug out your shoulders and look around the room. Maybe look at each other, because we are miracles of creation, and we are pieces of the sky that dances. I invite you to take a few moments to ponder some questions as we wake up from our reverie. And then I'm going to invite you to put them on a googly-eyed thing. And then you'll have a moment to put them on the tree or a piece of paper and keep it to yourself or leave it uh, below the tree, whichever you prefer. And the questions for your pondering are, what eulogy virtues might be spoken about you now? What extraordinary thing about you is part of your wholeness that no one knows about that you might be hiding under a scruffy yellow coat? In what ways are you part, a piece of the dancing sky? I'll give you a few moments to ponder these things and I'll invite Karen, ask Karen politely because we haven't talked about it if she could just play a, a something, anything, <laughs> while well, well, we do that. Thank you. Right on. Gordon's coming around with something if you don't. Thank you, Gordon.
Feel free to continue writing and pondering and thinking and hanging. Okay, it looks as good as I had imagined. Quite happy with that way it turned out. And to close out our service this morning, I invite you to hit sing hymn 1017, Building a New Way. Um, it's got a bit of a beat. And we might sing the verse, first verse a couple times over after we finish the third or fourth verse. So just be ready for that, because it might be fun. You never know. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are able. Uh, may, I would like to ask Robert to come forward to extinguish our chalice flame, please. While I read these words by Steve J. Crump. That which is worthy of doing, create with your hands. That which is worthy of repeating, speak 
with a clear voice. That which is worthy of remembering, hold in your hearts. And that which is worthy of living, go and live it now. Guess I better turn this mic on. John turned the mic on while I was singing. He smiled about it. (laughs) I'll get him back. Thank you again for being here. Thank you to everyone that made this service possible. Thank you for being here on Zoom or watching on YouTube. Thank you, all of the people. I can't start naming them because then I'll miss somebody. So you know who you are. I offer you these words of benediction as we take our leave from this place. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break and things can be mended, but not with time, as they say. They can be mended with intention. So go and love intentionally and love extravagantly. That's the most important one. Love extravagantly and love unconditionally. For the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is within you. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. And now let us sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. The words will show up just like that. It's magic. It's a miracle, just like you are. And we just do the thing. But don't hold hands if you don't want to. You don't have to hold hands. You have permission. Unless you like the person, unless you normally hold hands with the person. (laughs) 